What's up channel, Smithereens here. Everyone likes nostalgia, right? I mean, that's why it's nostalgic. And I'm not talking about the reboots or rehashes of our nostalgia, I'm talking about the things we actually adored as kids. But what may be nostalgic for one person may not be for another. It all depends on the activities you did and what media you consumed when you were a child. And one movie that definitely defined my childhood was Max Keeble's Big Move. So expect my surprise when I go on YouTube to see who else has talked about this movie, and like, no one has done a video on this movie. Barely a soul seems to be nostalgic for Max Keeble's Big Move. Move. Either it didn't make an impact on them, or they just didn't see it. Except for apparently Jordan Fringe, who made a video on Max Keeble's big move in the time I've been making this move. So yeah, thanks Jordan. Thanks for just ruining the whole premise of this video, man. All things ruined. <coughs> nah, I'm still doing it. Man, I don't know why this movie went so under the radar, because I remember finding it hysterical. But how clear are my rose-colored glasses? That's why today we're checking out the 2001 comedy film Max Keeble's Big Move in a segment I'm titling Obscure Vision. I didn't really think about titling my segments when I when I started making this channel, so I'm, I'm doing that now. The other ones I think would, they're, they're obscure and that's kind of what Obscure Vision is about, so I think they'd be an obscure vision, but whatever. Here's my cat and here is Max Keeble's Big Move. Real quick first, be sure to subscribe if you want to keep up with all my videos that I post, because I'm going to be covering other funny movies like this. And leave a like if you remember Max Keeble's big move. Oh, but really quick, let me tell you everything I had to do just to watch this movie. See, when I put the DVD in my computer, it required me to download a special media player just to open the DVD files. Uh, what was it again? Intel Actual Player? Yeah. And the movie still wouldn't play. So I had to end up playing it on my PS4. Thanks, Disney! It wasn't a complete waste of time, though, since I did come across the Max Keeble's DVD game, and that worked, surprisingly, on my computer. The game is just called Max Keeble's Food Fight, and the objective is similar to just, like, an arcade shooter, where it's, like, shoot the bad guys and don't shoot the good guys, with the bad guys being the bullies and the good guys being your friends. And I assume since this was just a cheap DVD game on the disc, that, you know, it'd be nothing or whatever, but... Oh, no, 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 no. Max Keeble's Food Fight game only has three levels, and I could not beat the third level. I played this game for a half hour, and I couldn't beat it. And I've beaten all the Dark Souls games, okay? This was stupid. I don't know, I don't know how the difficulty spike in, in this game worked, but... So, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't beat the game. Uh, but I did watch the movie, so let's get back to that. To start off, this movie is directed by Tim Hill, who is best known for writing on Spongebob. And the really early Spongebob that everyone prefers. I totally won't be mentioning that anymore on my channel. Hill also has experience with directing Muppets from Space, Alvin and the Chipmunks, and Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties. Hence, um... In a world where the messengers of truth bravely go forth to complete their appointed routes. The fast-paced camera movements and the cool whatever the heck this device is that he's holding, I don't even know. It's like a mini keyboard monitor thing? Is it even real? Who cares? It's blowing up. <laughs> this is awesome. And I know the main character doing a narrative voiceover thing is kind of overused, but I was a kid when I saw this movie and I hadn't seen Fight Club yet, so I just loved it from Max's perspective. It was like Fight Club for kids. Max Keeble here is played by Alex D. Linz, best known for Home Alone 3, or voicing Arnold in Nicktoons Racing. But today we're Nicktoon racing away from an ice cream truck trying to barrel over us, which is when we meet one of the more memorable characters from me as a kid, the evil ice cream man, who is expertly played by Jamie Kennedy, a.k.a. Fetterline from The Cleveland Show. For real, yo? Death tight. But you can hide, paper boy! Already, we get a sense of Max's history with this guy, with him referring to him as paper boy. I'd love to hate this guy as a kid. It was like the Ollie Jolly Man from Hey Arnold, but up to a hundred. And Alex Steelins voiced Arnold. I wonder if that was on purpose. This guy literally chases Max around, though, shooting ice cream at him out of the ice cream cone on top of his van. Dude, screw selling ice cream, you need to go on BattleBots. Then of course, since this is an early 2000s movie, we gotta have a Tony Hawk cameo. Oh, that ice cream man sure is evil. So the ice cream man is just booking it after Max and somehow he just can't catch up to this kid on his bike. That new Schwinn's really impressive. This movie makes me want to pull my old bike out, you know, and just go riding. But I know I just get winded uh, trying to keep up with the other vehicles chasing after me, so. They eventually stop and have a poorly dubbed kung fu fight scene, which, to be fair, didn't age well. I will defeat you with my complicated fighting move. The ice cream man gets hit in the nuts, yeeted, and Max is on his way to immediately running away again. Wait, what was the point of the eat then? 
Okay, then, whatever. So then Max bikes away over a conveniently placed truck ramp and lands in a girl's yard. Max tries to kiss the girl, but the evil ice cream man interrupts it with an ice cream blast. We see the girl get splashed with ice cream, and then Max wakes up because obviously this was all a dream. I mean, come on, it's an early 2000s movie. You gotta start off with a dream sequence. Just another check off on the old early 2000s bingo card. And if this is Max's dream, did we really have to end it on a shot of the girl he has a crush on getting hit in the face with ice cream? Just thought this was Max Keeble's big move, not Max Keeble's what dream. Ugh. So now we really get Max's day started and meet his parents. His mom, who has just gotten their house perfectly to her liking, and his dad, who works in advertising and is about to pee all over her perfect house by saying they have to move. I'm uh, kind of lobster. The lobster shack pitch today. Also, I like that the movie just plays in that kid fantasy thing that all adult jobs are just silly. Advertising majors in college are taking Mascot 101. On the school bus, we're introduced to Max's two best friends, Robe or Josh Peck. Uh, I'll just be calling him Josh Peck probably. And this girl, played by Zena Gray, she was like on house for a bit. She plays a band geek here though. Let's try to act sweet a can. Arriving at school, we jam out to one of the few songs I actually listened to from my sister's hand-me-down MP3 player, Greatest Day by Bowling for Soup. But someone who is not jamming out is the principal, who is played by Larry Miller. Known for acting in films such as The Nutty Professor, which has been brought up in my Alien Busters video, go check that one out, please. Miller does a fantastic job in this role, in my opinion. He was probably my favorite character upon rewatching. I especially love the running gag with him and his mouth spray. Dude just never stops hitting it. Next in our cast of characters, we meet the school bully, Troy McGinty. He is played by Noel Fisher, best known for playing Mickey on Shameless. No, it wasn't funny. Or voicing Michelangelo in the TMNT movies. And I know in media we like to portray school bullies as usually being one-dimensional, you know, the only trait they have being a bully. But again, they just take it to the next level. This guy takes bullying as like a career path. He actually has his own special way to announce the next kid that he's even going to bully. We learn from this random news reporter character, played by the brother from Malcolm in the Middle, Reese. He doesn't really do much here, but he's here. Say hi. Hi, Reese. The bully writes his victim's name on his shirt in red and black Sharpie because he's inspired by the edgiest character of all, Shadow the Hedgehog. That's who every edgy kid in middle school back in the early 2000s was inspired by. You're comparing yourself to me? Ah. This is pretty cool until you realize that this kid is just going to Walmart or wherever and buying a whole bunch of white shirts in bulk to then just write other kids' names on. And he's using their full names. Is he like going through the school directory like, all right, what's their name? That's Keeble! Here. Nice transition to the classroom though. They roll call and we get a dated rap reference in the entire character of Lil Romeo. What's up, I'm over here, Bode. Oh, Romeo's in the house. <laughs> he acted like this guy was really gonna mean something at some point. We get an announcement from the principal and then go to our next class where the teacher is running late for some reason. It's your first day and this is middle school. Get it together, lady. And when she gets here, she keeps making this disturbing smile. Now prepare yourselves for a scene that I was really hoping was just a daydream or something. It's not. Pheromones. Nature's dating service. It's how many species attract mates. Attraction. In the opposite sex. I definitely don't remember this scene being so saucy as a boy, but now I see why I liked this movie. Oh, but it's okay. She was just attracting a bird. So you can close your mouth now, Joshy. <laughs> Transitioning with the Britney Bop of Hit Me Baby One More Time, Max gets hit in the face with a door. We find out Max is not as good with the ladies as he is in his dreams. No ice cream blast for him today, I guess. But he also runs into Troy McGinty. We discover that Max and Troy used to be best friends until Troy got scared at one of Max's birthday parties. So what scared him? Is there a wee little daddy having his birthday? <laughs> Googles, the frog, a Scottish frog mascot with bagpipes. Hey, Mr. Cable. I still find the kids saying McGoogles ain't Max's daddy funny. I know it's not as realistic because the kid isn't like crying with real tears, but I, I, I don't think they had that serious of a director on Cry kid, we need tears. Be afraid of McGoogles. So Troy tosses Max in the mud and in the trash. Students, your new football stadium. <laughs> you there, prankster. And man, the attention and detail they put into making Max look disgusting here is just very effective. He looks rancid. 
but he showers off in the school sprinklers. I remember my middle school gym having a shower, but I guess that works too. Just another way this movie was a kid fantasy. I wanted to go get really dirty and then shower off in the sprinkler and get dried off with a reef blower. Reef blower? Leaf blower. I've been watching way too much Spongebob lately. Now we're introduced to our last major player, Dobbs, played by Orlando Brown from That's So Raven. <laughs> His backstory is that he's a mean rich kid. Max literally calls him a stock market whiz kid that was a millionaire by age 10, but by age 12 he lost it all. No clue what Orlando Brown would have spent all that money on. Baby, please, give me one more chance. I can change. <laughs> Next class is banned where we get a confrontation between the girl Max has a crush on and his best friend. Not Josh Peck, uh, the, uh, the girl. What are you doing sitting in my seat? Say your name on it or something? Yes. Shoo shoo. Can you believe her? Whoa, how on earth did you not notice her name that big on the chair? This scene tries playing it like the crush is being a mean girl. I mean, they're both being mean girls, but the best friend totally seems to be more in the wrong. Looks like school's over for this act one as everyone leaves school and the groups of kids gather around to clap for each other doing skateboard jumps. They're not even doing tricks, just doing jumps. Skateboarding kids is on the 2000s bingo card, oh, but wearing helmets will lose you cool points. Then because 2000s movie, we have to have a plethora of animal cast members, but especially a monkey. This is Tad. I helped nurse him when he was a baby. We've been buds ever since. I don't really know why people like seeing monkeys so much in films around this time. <laughs> what the heck am I saying? I like seeing monkeys in films. I think we need more monkey themed movies. And I want to find one of these outdoor animal shelters where I could just go be best buds with a monkey. But it's not as fun as all these animals would make it seem since the animal shelter will be closing in a week since someone bought up the land. Although not really sure how good of an animal shelter this is with that small of a cage. But this is a kid's movie, so we don't know what animal cruelty is, what? Max finally goes home and is told the title of the movie. We're moving? Yeah, Boach wants me to head up a new division. When? Friday. This bites. Max tells his friends the news and they lament by moving wrecked cars with heavy machinery. Is this what other kids did for fun growing up? Because I was playing Kingdom Hearts. The next day at school, Megan wants Max's help spreading flyers to help save the animal shelter, but he's too depressed to care about saving his apparently best monkey friend that we don't care about. Best friend my monkey butt! The saving the shelter plan does not go over well at the principal, however. And then he stops Max in the hall to tell him, I'm buying this shelter. Oh, and another bingo checkoff for the short sleeve shirt over long sleeve shirt. Mm -hmm. Where did you think I was going to build Nebworth Stadium in your house? Ha ha, your house, that's rich. There wouldn't be room. So yeah, the principal is buying the shelter to build a football stadium. Spray spray. Big bad Troy McGinty is back with a new shirt and is now targeting Josh Peck. Let's see what he does to him. <laughs> All right, guys, hit the showers. <laughs> Hello, freak. Troy, please don't Shawshank Redemption Josh Peck. No, luckily, uh, he just sticks him in the human-sized trophy case in the middle of the hallway. You know, that nice piece of furniture installed in every school. And it only locks from the outside, I suppose. Not happy that he helped his friend out, though, Troy gives Max a swirly. On the house from Orlando Brown, since, you know, he's actually charging kids to go to the bathroom. What? Hold on, stop the screen, what does that say? It costs $9 to barf, $6.50 just to spit. Oh, come on, and number three is not even a deal. It's just the same price as number one and number two added up. Max, having been swirlied, yet having spikier hair than before. You may kill my spikes, but that will only make them stronger. Is late to class, and the teacher gives him a 2,000 word essay due on Friday. But Friday is after he moves. So Max realizes he can now do anything in school without really facing long-term consequences. This leads into a fun scene where Max costs causes chaos around the classroom. He cuts a phone cord, which is a very dated thing to say now. He kicks a globe. Make that 8,000 words and take your seat now. Take your seat? Lady, call the campus security already. If you're ever in the windy city, look me up. Eight. Max, unless you're moving out of the country, I think those long-term consequences might follow you. And with that, Max ditches class and begins planning his big moves before his big move. He talks the plan over with his friends at their favorite abandoned construction site, and the next day it goes into action. First, they go after Orlando Brown and the evil ice cream man. Somebody froze your assets, man. Let's see what we can do about that. Hey! Step off, capitalist tool. Why don't you go get a real job, fool? The evil ice cream man is just an ice cream man at this point. He's selling ice cream and this guy's upset he can't steal the kids' money. Like, dude, that's just my job. 
but they're successful in stealing the ice cream man's coil in Orlando Brown's poop price tagger machine. Now it's to hit Troy Mother Ginting McGinty. They prank him by playing the McGoogles theme song anytime he opens his locker. It's time to play a game with your favorite Highland. But that's just the start to the psychological torment they're gonna put this kid through, don't you worry. With Robe acting as a distraction, Max steals some of the animal pheromones from the science classroom as some sort of prank. Ah, see, so that initial first day where she taught each boy how to pitch a tent was completely justified. It's logical in the early 2000s if it leads to a hilarious gag. That night, Max's dad walks in on him on the computer and he has to quickly exit out of what he was looking at. It's okay, dad, it's not what you think. I was looking at... How to pick a lock with a paper clip. And some beautiful 90s web design there. Welcome! You gotta do things that you don't want to do because... Other people who have power over you tell you to do them. You know, if you rise up and show that you're not afraid, those people will no longer have control over your life. Max is just telling his dad to go into his boss's office with a sword and be like, I am not afraid. Then we won't have to move because you'll be fired. His dad tries to comfort Max to the idea of moving, but rebellious Max has a new outlook on life. But Lizzie McGuire's dad just chuckles it off and tossles his hair like all dads in media must do to their young boys. In the dark, Max and his friends break into the school to prank Principal Gindrake. Max takes the animal pheromone from the science class and puts it into the principal's mouth spray. So is the prank to make the animals like mate with the principal's mouth? K. Okay. And gasp! The principal left his PowerPoint open where he created a pie chart for his cartoonally misappropriated school funds. We've got 97% for the football stadium, 1% for teacher's salaries. Sounds accurate. One for textbooks and one for breath spray. Then Max quickly executes one last prank as the school guard finds them. But they're able to escape because the guard apparently is senile or something. Did he not see what his flashlight was literally flashing light on five seconds ago? And then he finds an open window and he's just like, well, nothing to report here. The next day, Max and his mom talk before he gives her a loving pat on the shoulder. You know, like how you show love to your mom as a kid. Before making off with his dad's Magoogles costume. That's when Max pulls probably the biggest flex in all of middle school history. He calls out the school bully in his own patented fashion. Actually, he one-ups McGinty with the red sleeves and collar and spray painting it instead of just writing it on. Well played, Keeble. So, what's he got in store for Troy? Not that Troy. Oh, I lied. Sorry. No. No, not you. You're not even real. Get away from me. Oh my god! That frog is gonna destroy that boy! This is payback for what you did to Josh Peck in the locker room. Time for you to play with my bagpipe! And that tongue! Wah. Call me by your name, and my name is McGoogles, and I like a swampy log. After that Law & Order SVU opener, we are introduced to Superintendent Nebworth, who is not only Gindrake's boss, but also the person who needs to approve the football stadium Gindrake wants. The stadium is even called Nebworth Stadium after him, since the principal has such an obsession with this guy. Remember this? Yeah. It's your championship jockstrap. We washed it. Wash it again. He'll tell his assistant later, cancel the washing. <laughs> Although Nebworth doesn't seem to be as corrupt as the principal, I guess he's not in the pocket of big breath spray. Returning to the gym, the basketball team arrives. Someone please break it to most of these kids that they should not get used to being on the basketball team past middle school with growth spurts like that. They all find the bully traumatized in the fetal position, repeating that McGoogles was going to eat him. So I guess whatever Max did worked, and the courts can't legally prove what that was. In the next scene, we see the effects of the animal pheromone breath spray start to take effect as various animals make noises and the monkey just 
swings out his open door? Who forgot to close the monkey door? I feel like that's the door that would especially need to be closed. Maybe this is the exact reason the animal shelter is getting shut down. Instead of the monkey yet though, a wild squirrel enters the library and then the principal's suit. The principal starts freaking out, but luckily some zany salsa music starts playing to drown out the obvious sounds eight feet away from the superintendent. <laughs> this year. The evil ice cream man, now without his freezing coil, is given a random early 2000s technology device clue. What even is this? Looks like a 3DS from the side, but then it's like a beeper texture thing? Going into lunch, Max does what any kid would do if they thought they didn't have consequences, and starts a food fight. Served. Check and meet. <laughs> Who threw that? I like that the chess kid just believed the first kid who stands up with a big turd eating grin, but he's gullible and a food fight ensues. Well, like most food fight scenes, and even to be fair, just fight scenes in general, the blocking is somewhat forced, but it's still just really fun to watch, even as an adult, honestly. The various foods flying around, the teacher just getting dunked into the trash can like she's the character in Bully, Josh Peck's mustard tuba leaf blower cannon combo. The food fight comes to a cease. Once the principal enters with the superintendent, he begins asking who started the food fight just as the monkey comes in with a dash attack. <laughs> Having been made a fool of, the superintendent tells the principal off and leaves. Given that you've been spraying pheromones in your mouth, be happy that the monkey is just hopping on your back. That evening, Orlando Brown gets an email to meet up at the junkyard to get his handheld back. That's what that weird device he's been using was apparently. A handheld. Yeah, you heard me. I said I want my handheld. You want me to hold your hand? The evil ice cream man also goes there for his coil, but the two of them just start to squabble. Until Max uses a professional construction crane to dump the melted ice cream from the ice cream truck on the two of them. Oh, so that's why they were hanging out at the construction site. So it would make sense later why Max knows how to fully operate a crane. Duh, duh. Gag equals logic. Max dips out to go to the going away party that his friends were throwing for him. Just as these two realize that they've been tricked by Max, McGinty is making progress in therapy. You know what they call me out there? <laughs> the Magoogler. And realizes that Max must have been the cause of Magoogles Magoogling him. Principal Jin Drake figures out Max started the food fight because a monkey is on the animal shelter flyer and a monkey jumped on his back. Bit of a reach, but okay. And as Max Keeble is getting noticed by his enemies, He's also getting noticed by the awkwardly way taller girl he has a crush on. Seriously, just look at this shot. She looks like his mom taking him to soccer practice. She takes Max to hang out where all the cool kids hang out, the milkshake shop. And I'm sorry, but just look at like this other such older and taller girl like right here. And then just look at this other extra back here. It's so young. Real talk though, when does chugging a bunch of milkshakes actually make you cool? I did that all the time in middle school. I wasn't cool for like a second. You're so devious. Well, uh, it's really what I like to call my, my fatitude. Yo, don't crowd the man, dude. He has fatitude. Dude, I'm just the waiter. I was just bringing you your milkshake you ordered. If this is a student, he's a student in college. Forced slang aside, Max is neglecting his friend's party. And I wouldn't do that to Josh. He will not invite you to his wedding. Although maybe we know why Josh didn't invite Drake now. But Max does, partying into the night by dancing on the table to Little Romeo. Another thing I did all the time in middle school that didn't make me cool. I knew it should have been Soldier Boy. His friends find him and are not happy. Megan runs off and Josh tells Max what for. I guess we're just not cool enough for you. But Megan, she really likes you. Oh, wait. You know what? I, I've been waiting. Now I'm going home. Have a nice life in Chicago. So Max feels like a jerk, but he feels even worse the next day when his dad comes in and drops the bomb. We're not moving. I finally gave Boge some of his own medicine. We're gonna stay here and I'm gonna start my own business. We're not moving? Thinking about everything he's done and overcome with the guilt of his sin, Max falls to the ground and dies. No, okay, no, this isn't a chick tract. That didn't happen. 
But he does faint and apparently wakes up the next day in the car and having his clothes changed because that's precisely where Max and his dad continue this conversation. I owe it all to you. You're the one that helped me realize Foch was nothing but a bully. I I'm just a kid. What do I know? So Max is left to face his bullies and the school. He hides at first, discovering his bullies are now targeting his friends as his substitute. Here's a clip disturbing out of context. From here on in, you work for me. <laughs> Yee. Yee. Pulling out the flavor flav there, Orlando. And even his crush doesn't like him after the principal announces all extracurricular activities and fun are suspended because of Max's food fight. Max, not wanting to go to class, ducks out into the janitor's closet. I'm pretty sure this guy was the night guard too, so let's just assume he lives in the boiler room. But he does give Max some solid advice and his only line in the film. Any kid can make a mess. It takes a man to clean it up. Yes, take this life advice from a school trash man. With that nugget of wisdom, Max hijacks the principal's announcement camera and apologizes to his friends while telling McGinty and Orlando Dobbs Brown to go after him instead of his friends. And he fesses up to the food fight. But Principal Jindrake doesn't care and shuts down the heartwarming speech, as well as his camera, making sure that it's off. But Max swiftly turns it back on once Jindrake turns away for like a second. Basically, the whole school hears the principal admit to his corruption. So I fiddled with the budget. Fewer textbooks, big deal. Textbooks are for nerds. Band is for losers. So the janitor has to work overtime for no pay. He should pay me for the privilege. Oh, so maybe the night guard thing is a reference to all the overtime the principal's making him work. I still wouldn't take his life advice though. Although Jin Drake's still unaware, takes Max and locks him in the storage closet. Now stay there. <laughs> Good on him snagging that TP. Never know when the panic buying will start. So after school, the boys wait for Max like they should. But isn't he locked up? Well, Jindre goes to check up on Max and we see that the door is open and Max is gone. The principal goes in to look for Max and gets locked in by the janitor. Caged like an animal. Ironic. So back to the showdown then. Max actually comes in with no plan, just ready to try to kick butt or have his butt be kicked. But Megan steps forward to help. She plays a tune on her flute to We're Not Gonna Take It and We're Not Gonna Take That Risk with the YouTube censors picking it up. But the song does rally all the less cool kids to come and help stand up to the bullies. Along with some foreign exchange football guys the principal just brought in to pad his team. They take the bullies to be dumped in the trash and given a piece of their own medicine. Max intervenes though and asks if they are not just as bad as the bullies. We are no better than the bullies if we do exactly what the bullies do. We all. We need to stand together and make our school a better place for everyone. <laughs> that man's got a point. Yeah. What should we do with them? So Max says that they should just let them go. And the football guys let them go right into the dumpsters, which completely negates everything Max just said. <laughs> Although this crying kid is the best though. And this is when the cool crush girl comes crawling back to Max. Wow, how cool are you? A bunch of us are having a party this weekend. Ninth graders only. Whoa, she is in the ninth grade and he's in the sixth. <laughs> Just a big age gap for being that young, in my opinion. Luckily, Max says he'll be busy with his friends as everyone else just quietly watches. They're all just standing around in the background, staring at nothing. It's like the background characters for Family Guy. But the quiet watching is broken up as the principal, who was never actually really locked up as it turns out, is trying to commit vehicular manslaughter. Oh no, he's just taking the bulldozer to the animal shelter through the school parking lot. Shouldn't there be like a guy with a permit controlling that thing? Maybe not. This must be a universe where all construction men have disappeared, hence why Max was controlling the crane. We'll call it the Keebleverse. I keep biting my lower lip a lot. Why am I doing that? I'm doing that a bunch. Max, not wanting the shelter to be demolished, front flips onto an ostrich and gets going. I'm not kidding. He confronts Jindrake and gets ready to kick the crap out of him with Dream Kung Fu. Kung Fu's no good here, Max. <laughs> but the spray gets those animals all hot and bothered, even though I can clearly hear a kitten meow mixed into the sound. So Max does this. See, because he's a paper boy, and paper boys are all notoriously accurate at throwing newspapers. What? I do like that they made him do that, even though in this next shot, look. The wall over here is already just falling down for no reason, so they have to cut really quick. Man, 
principals kind of seem like they could get out on their own. But the main character has to be important! The principals run off by the shelter animals, including horses, birds, and even ducks, apparently. The shelter had to house ducks. With that, we get a newspaper heading saying that the principal has been fired, accompanied by a Keeble voiceover telling us how everything was wrapped up in a nice little bow after the first week of school. I don't get you, paper boy! Now Max is just back to his normal routine, where the worst thing he has to worry about is a fully grown man driving around the neighborhood trying to kill him. And this has been Max Keeble's Big Move, directed by Tim Hill and starring Little Romeo. This movie was for sure my favorite live action movie growing up as a kid. My favorite animated film being The Emperor's New Groove. And sure, it may not have aged perfectly, but I was actually pleasantly surprised with the quality upon rewatching. It almost just feels like a live action cartoon movie, and damn if that's not fun to watch as a kid. It also just looks like this movie was a heck of a lot of fun to make, which is probably more that can be said for the Max Keeble's video game. Anyways, thank you all for listening to me blabber on about this film from my nostalgia. Leave me a comment letting me know if this movie was nostalgic for you growing up, or any other movies around the time that were nostalgic for you that you think I should check out. And hey, if you're still watching, just leave a like while you're here, huh? Hit that subscribe button so you know when I come out with other videos and stuff. Maybe you hit the notification bell so you get notified about them. That'd be cool. I'm putting down a new video every week, so hey, you know. But anyways, this has been Smithereens, and I'm on to my next big movie picture show project thing. YouTube video. I should have just called it. Should have just said I was on to my next YouTube video. Yeah. I'll see you in that one.